Up until now, we've just looked at how to measure for and how to make a bespoke orthopedic last. A lot of people think that once you've got the last, you can do anything with the shoe and it doesn't matter because it's all to do with the last. And that's not true. Although the last is the core element of bespoke orthopedic footwear, and without one, the whole thing is a struggle, it's only one third of the process. The other two thirds being the uppers and what happens there, and the soles and the heels and what happens there. For instance, if somebody's got a narrow, hypermobile foot that really needs containing and supporting, so we make the last very carefully to be very enclosing of their foot, and then we go and make a shoe on it that's just totally floppy, has no stitches, maybe even doesn't even have a lining, all that careful uh, shaping of the last will be of no avail. So if we've done that to the last, we have to do the same thing for the shoe. So in this shoe, for instance, you've got very firm, narrow, contained stiffeners. The stiffener comes right forward, and the whole thing is replicating what the last does. So it's, the shoe has to mimic the intent of the last. In fact, the, the thing that set me out on orthopedic shoemaking as a whole, as opposed to just being a bespoke orthopedic last maker, was when I was working in Soho in London, uh, making lasts for the public, they would then take them to other shoemakers who would make them any style they wanted and didn't pay attention to the insoles or the stiffeners or any of the detailing of the shoe, just made them whatever they wanted and the last would come back and, uh, and the, the person would say, well, it doesn't work. And I would say, well, it's not the last that's wrong. There's something wrong with the shoe. And then the shoemaker would say, no, no, it's the last. And, and, you know, and then we'd get nowhere. So that's when I started to venture into encompassing the whole process. And, my, and so I'm doing that for 42 years now. And that's the kind of history of, of, uh, of that really based in the, if you're not doing the whole thing, you might as well not do any part of it, really. Okay, so how do we then get from a person walking in the door with a certain condition to making a shoe where they can walk out the door uh, happier and uh, better balanced and uh, with a future ahead of them? There's been, uh, we've checked and we've, actually catalogued over 60 conditions that uh, people have that have brought them uh, through the door. Conditions which affect the feet in such a way that they can't buy shoes, that they're in pain, they're having trouble walking, and, uh, and they need something specially made. So that seems like a huge ask to study 60 different conditions and figure out, you know, how are we going to make a shoe based on this condition and uh, what, you know, go and find a person that had that condition before, what did we do for them? Well, we don't do that because our experience has told us that many of the conditions uh, that uh, have a root cause that is uh, widely different um, can actually end up in a very, very similar foot. For instance, if somebody has a stroke, then in other words, a brain bleed in the, in the motor nerve area of their uh, brain, which causes uh, the foot to go into spasm or to be out of control. Or if somebody has, say, multiple sclerosis, where there's swelling and, and disease in the brain stem, which is affecting the uh, nerves of the foot. Or somebody has a back injury, say, to the uh, L5 or the S1 area of the back, which again interrupts the nerve that are controlling the foot, or indeed if somebody has a foot deformity or diabetes, all of these things can disrupt the nervous control of the motor control of the foot. And so if you look at this foot, you can see how it rolls out. And I know this is diabetes, but it could equally be um, a, a brain injury or, you know, you know, a car crash, a brain injury in the a back injury. It could be multiple sclerosis or it could be um, a congenital deformity like charcot marie tooth disease or a stroke. But the treatment is still the same. Give room there, but at the same time, keep it soft over the protruding bone and then bring the ground 
up to meet the foot where the foot's tending to go over there. So you need to have the ground come up so that the heel and the sole are supporting it. That's the key, not the origin of the disease, but the key to the treatment strategy. So we call that a treatment strategy. And what we've found is that although there's over 60 conditions, there's only eight categories of condition that, that all of these huge variety of conditions can lead to a foot deformity. And those are, just to run through them, chronic soft tissue swelling, fragile skin, anesthesia, chronic internal pain, hypermobility, first degree deformity, second degree deformity, third degree deformity. Chronic tissue swelling, this is where the, the foot bulges and can become very large here, and that can be caused by anything from lymphedema, again diabetes, or something going on with the uh, diuretics of the person, or it can be caused by an industrial injury. We have examples I can show you of all of those, and they all look pretty similar. The next one is fragile skin. Fragile skin can have a number of causes. It can be, again, diabetes. It keeps, keeps coming up, and it's big now. You know, 8% of the population is, has got, uh, got diabetes uh, that we know about, and uh, it's soon to be much higher if we keep on going the way we're going. So fragile skin can be caused by a genetic deformity, which we've dealt with, where, you know, the skin can easily shear one away from the other. Uh, lymphedema can uh, disrupt the healing, of natural healing of the skin so that the metabolic byproducts aren't drained away, so the skin actually becomes very festered and, and easily damaged. Um, Again, diabetes can lead to skin getting very, very hard um, and therefore fragile and brittle. And uh, there are a variety of other diseases which affect the skin. Uh, too many steroids, if, if you've been on steroids for years and years. Um, the skin can be so fragile that the amount of pressure required to hold the shoe on is greater than the, shoe can act, than the foot can actually take. And so you have to design a shoe that uh, spreads the load out so no part of the skin is, is taking uh, too much load. Another one is anesthesia. Again, diabetes, or it could be a number of uh, diseases that affect the sensory nerves, as distinct from the motor nerves. And so here's a tester. It's a 10-gram tester, this little filament. Uh, pushes with 10 grams, and you know, I can feel that, I can tell, it's my little finger, it's going up my arm. Whereas as somebody with an anesthetic foot, you know, you could do that with a nail, never, never mind this, but you use this to go around the foot and find that parts of it are totally insensitive. And um, because, uh, uh, because of that, you know, you think, oh, well, end of problem, you know, no pain, you know, I could stick my foot in the court shoes or do what I like because there's no pain. Well, actually, you'd lose your foot if you did that. Uh, the, an anesthetic foot is one of the most vulnerable feet there are. Uh, say, you know, inevitably in the last year, most of you will have had a stone go down your shoe. If that happened in an anesthetic foot, you know, you can end up with an amputation. Uh, so uh, there's whole kind of treatment strategies for the anesthetic foot, which protects it, makes it comfortable, and ensures that the person has a much better chance of keeping their foot for the uh, next several years. Another one is chronic internal pain. And this is something like, say, osteoarthritis, where it doesn't matter whether they're in barefoot, no matter how comfortable the shoe, the simple act of, say, bending the, the toe joint causes terrible pain. And how do you walk without bending your toe joint? Well, you have a specialist bespoke orthopedic shoe that's very, very firm so that the foot doesn't have to bend at that part. And then you put a roll bar. So again, this is something you do with the soles, the heels, and the insert so that the person can walk easily without ever having to bend that toe. So chronic internal pain is a big solution is footwear. And, and in a way, there's no other way around it. 
hypermobility. You see these young people that, you know, do gymnastics, they can bend right over, they can bend their thumb back to hit their radius, and that seems fun and great party tricks and enables you to do gymnastics and everything. But you think of the foot, in a hypermobile foot, as the uh, bones grow longer, the muscles grow in response to the bone growth, but there's no range of motion within the, the joints of the foot to control and contain the, the foot as it grows. And, and it can be that the calf muscles are so strong, uh, but they, they don't have a range of motion to push against, so they cause the foot to collapse or something. So our job with, a, say, a teenager with hypermobility or a young 20-year-old with hypermobility is to contain the foot and give it that uh, contained mobility so that the foot continues to grow in a healthy way until everything gets established, and then it's much less of a problem. And you can see that a lot of the bunions and hammer toes that we came, uh, uh, we see, say, in the 30s and 40s, this person was very, very beautiful, agile, uh, hypermobile foot when they were in their teens. Then we come to a series of uh, deformities. So a first degree deformity is one where you say to the person, okay, you're, you're really rolled in, you're really flat footed, can you raise the inner border of your foot? And they go, yeah, sure, sure. And they raise the inner border of their foot, their knees turn back out, and the foot becomes healthy. So why don't they do that day to day as they walk around? Because there's something going on somewhere in the heel, the subtalar joint, or in the forefoot uh, that's causing the foot to drop inwards. So they can correct it, but as soon as they think about something else, down it goes. And so the, the strategy with that is using the whole shoe, perhaps an orthotic like this, made by a podiatrist, or we actually make the shoe in such a way that those underlying causes that are making the person uh, roll inwards are no longer there, so the person then naturally corrects and takes on the correct shape. A second degree deformity is, again, say the flat foot, and we say, can you raise the inner borders of their foot? And no, they can't. Okay, so we go in, we put our hand in, and we lift it up, and it goes. And they say, does that feel better? And they say, yeah, that feels really good, but I haven't got the strength to do that myself. That's a second degree deformity. So a first degree is one they can correct themselves. A second degree is one that can be uh, corrected with an external support. Again, probably correcting the, the original uh, imbalances. But this is a bit further down the line. They've been in that position so long that they can no longer correct it. And so then we can do things with arch supports and um, subtalar joint correction or a variety of finding what was the original underlying cause, but also how can we support the muscles so that the, uh, to some extent the uh, deformity is corrected by the, the strength of the shoe and bringing the ground reaction forces up under the arch to replace what the, uh, the muscles should be doing. If you do that um, and you give them enough uh, movement, uh, then those muscles can uh, then become stronger and uh, they become less dependent on the shoe. Um, so that it's, you know, it's good. You don't want to make them addicted to the shoe. You want the shoe to be uh, helping them develop their muscles and, and their uh, right alignment, if you can. A third degree deformity is you ask them, again, looking at, a, say, a flat foot, you ask them to lift their inner border. They can't. You go and lift it, and they go, ow, oh, that really hurts. And you realize you've just got to make it for that shape. You know, this... Uh, this gentleman, no way would we want to push in there, push it back. We just make it to that shape and we make sure it doesn't get worse. And so that's the, uh, the, the eighth of the uh, condition categories. Now, in our toolbox, uh, when I say toolbox, I don't mean, you know, all the stuff, the hundreds of tools in this workshop, but I mean the toolbox of the shoe. The shoe is a toolbox, if you like. There's uh, 13 elements as distinct, the last, of course, would make it 14, but there's 13 elements that we have as a tool to help deal with these eight condition categories. And by the way, some, uh, some, con uh, some conditions like uh, diabetes, keep going back there because it's a big one, 
they can have four of those condition categories going on. But each of the condition categories has to be dealt with, even though it's one of several. The 13 elements of bespoke orthopedic footwear design, in addition to the last, are the style, the upper materials, lining materials, appliques and findings, insoles, inserts and corks, stiffeners, toe puffs, welts, soles, waist, heels, and the top piece. So our toolbox consists of 13 elements in the shoe, of which the style is only one. So, as I said before, somebody thinks, oh, well, I've got my last, now I can have any style I want. Well, no, you can't. Um, for instance, if you have a chronic tissue swelling and your foot is, say, 20 mil bigger over here in the afternoon than it is in the morning, and you have an a Oxford shoe, well, the Oxford shoe gets really big like that on the lacings, and it looks awful, plus the fact that it's still fixed uh, on a closed facing at the bottom. If you have a Derby shoe, then it opens up, it looks good when the facings are close together, and it still looks good when they're open. But a Derby shoe is still fixed across the bottom. If you have a shoe where the laces come right down, like in a trainer, then you can have the facings open or closed, and, and it looks good all the time. So the style is critical in that, in that example, and we'll look at that in more detail la later. But this choice of style, and, uh, and, and people can get really stuck on, <clears throat> on the style they really want, and we have to be quite firm with them. If you have this style, you know, you can sign this thing. If something goes wrong, and we guarantee it, it will, it's your responsibility. <clears throat> but we've since learned that, when I say, yeah, it's, it, I'll take responsibility for that, what they mean is they'll take responsibility for bringing it back to us and getting us to make another shoe. So we just don't do that. Um, you know, if they don't trust us, then they can go to somebody else uh, because our choice of style is critical. Um, the upper material, so you know, you get the right style. This is made out of kid. This is made out of a light calf leather. This is made out of a cordovan, actually, uh, a very, very uh, expensive leather from America. Uh, very, very thick, beautifully polished. Just this, this leather will last for a very long time. But you couldn't make that shoe out of cordovan, and neither could you make this shoe out of glacé kid. It, it would be crazy. And of course, if, if, you know, just because somebody's got a deformity doesn't mean that if they get, we get it all sorted out, they can't have a fell boot and go walking in the, the Kernegs or something. Uh, and, and so we got some really, really powerful thick leathers that are waterproof and flexible. Uh, so there's a huge variety in the upper materials. The linings, of course, they go against the skin. And uh, one of the uh, elements of fragile skin is being allergic to uh, a glues, but also to chromium. And so we have some very, very uh, lovely, soft leathers that uh, have been tanned, not with chrome, but with uh, veg tan like sumac and uh, various other um, uh, tanning elements that aren't, uh, don't, the skin does not react to. And so we can choose those. Uh, so the lining, in a way, is as in, well, and technically, it's, it's probably more important than the upper leather because that's what's against the skin. Then there's the appliques and findings. If you look at these two examples, both of these are bunions, hammer toes, and there's all kinds of weird and wonderful stuff going under this tie flap and under this golf flap, but the eye goes straight to the applique and doesn't see what's going on underneath. And uh, so under, underneath there's actually a lace, hole cut lace shoe, and under here there's an elastic on the instep. Uh, so two different uh, struck types of uh, uh, a solution underneath, but either applique could have gone on these shoes. And it's, it's a distracting, uh, but very, very effective. You, you know, you can put a, a bling and stuff like that and really attract the eye away from what's really going on orthopedically underneath. Insoles. You can have an insole that's made to the cast. So that's a full contact insole. We can make the last so that it is full contact, uh, so that it evenly distributes the uh, weight bearing under the foot. Um, 
uh, the insoles can be turned up. They can come right up under, under the arch and support the arch. Um, they can be reinforced or they can uh, be soft and flexible and they can be very bendy or they can be stiff. Uh, so that the foot doesn't bend at all, all depending on what the client actually needs in terms of their conditions and their condition categories. The other thing is the stiffeners. We mentioned before, the stiffener on this shoe comes well forward and supports under the arch and supports the whole back foot. So this person had hypermobility when they're young. They're still a bit hypermobile back here, and, but now that has led to bunions and hammer toes, and so we've given all the room and the softness here and all the firmness here, and that's coming from the stiffener. Uh, sometimes you can't have a stiffener because it hurts them. You know, fragile skin, you might have a little tiny stiffener in there, or some people have something called a Haglund's bump, where there's a sensitive bar part in the back of the heel, so you cut the stiffener away and it, everything else is held but that one sensitive spot. So the whole structure around uh, stiffeners is a really, really important tool in our toolbox. Another one is the toe puff in here, so it's a to toe box. If that wasn't in there, this whole thing would just crease and fall flat. Some people say, I don't want a toe puff. And they say, you do want a toe puff. And they say, no, I don't want a toe puff. So at the fitting stage, they come and they say, why is my shoe all collapsed? And they say, because you haven't got a toe puff. And they say, okay. So we give them a wall toe puff like this. So it goes around here, but it's not on top. See how that's soft and that's firm. And, and that, that's for their hammer toes. So there's all kinds of strategies like that. You know, if they ride horses and they're having, you know, a lot of horse injuries, you know, it's a very dangerous thing to do to ride a horse and the, and the foot and the leg can get really mashed. So you make an, orth in an orthopedic riding boot, you've got to make a massive toe puff so that the horse steps on their toe, it doesn't crush it. Uh, and you can do steel as well, of course. So toe puff's a big tool. Then we have the welt. The welt is the edge. So you can see on this, you can see the edge. On this one, you can't. This is actually a concealed welt because you just want to see. It's a dress shoe. It's for dancing and parties, you know. It's not meant to be able to see the sole. Whereas in this one, it's giving a bit of protection. And we can actually, you know, stitch on, say on this one, we can actually stitch a welt on that actually comes right out and gives huge protection and then um, stitch that into the uh, shoe and then stitch the welt onto the sole. Other examples here, again, uh, applied for, you know, rubber soles or, or for a thinner leather sole. And then right through to fine, fine little rands that um, create a, a segue between the upper and the sole. And that's really important because if you've got sensitive skin or something, your fragile skin, everything's going right, and then you bang against a curb or a wall, then that's going to protect your foot. So the, there's practical reasons as well as visible reasons uh, for the uh, welt, um, and very, very important. You can also use the welt to, um, you know, come around here and actually give you an extra four or five millimeters of ground reaction force leverage around that joint. It's a very, very important detail. The soles and the heels, that is a whole science in itself. That is one third of the bespoke shoe, the welt, the waist, the soles, the heels, how the profile works. And we're, we're going to actually talk about that extensively. Uh, but just look at the different heels. Supposing this, uh, he obviously wouldn't, but supposing he had a little kitten heel like that. See, there's no ground reaction force there. So, you know, he'll just go over. So what he really needs is a big, massive stacked heel like that, which is going to, so that the ground reaction force comes up under the heel and stops the whole thing going over. The choice of heel is really, really important. Here's a Louis Cans. See how, even though it looks a bit like this simple covered heel, it, it's got a similar feel of elegance, but it comes wide again. And when the top piece is on, it's still quite wide at the bottom. Uh, so you see that in this shoe. Even though it's a really interesting heel, it's actually got quite a lot of uh, stability in the frontal plane. 
Uh, so those are all really important considerations and of course we can always uh, you know, get a big chunk of EVA uh, rubber and make a very lightweight uh, but still very firm heel uh, so because a lot of people the weight of the shoe is important you know because uh, their, their muscles are weak and so to pick a heavy shoe up and walk uh, it would just be very tiring for them. And the last thing is the, the top piece and, and also, the, you know, the sticker sole on here, the actual surface that's on the ground when the person's walking. You know, some people, uh, they might want something that gives them a lot of grip in the snow, in the wet. You know, otherwise, you, you know, from January, you know, from December, January, February, they can't go out. So they need something really grippy, but they don't want, um, you know, it's a very expensive shoe. They don't want something that's really intrusive, you know, like a commando sole. Um, so you've got to find a right balance between giving them a lot of grip in the snow and something that still looks like a nice shoe. Um, to give you an example of how uh, important a top piece is, uh, I once had a client who uh, had a very, very severe uh, stroke. And so the only way she could walk would be to uh, put, and you can see the difference in these two top pieces, one's smooth and the other's grippy, so I'm pushing with the same pressure. On this foot she had something like this because she had to stand like this and then she had a smooth top piece and a sticker sole on the uh, right foot so she would go like that because she was stable here. And then she would pick this foot up and go there. So this had to be really rock stable in the carpet and then this would slide. So uh, that actually spoiled the shoe until we got that right. We had a really sticky uh, Sticker sole and heel on the uh, left, and a real smooth, slidey one on the right. And that gives you an example of how you can have all 13 elements in your toolbox. You can have the last right, uh, and then one wrong decision uh, in something like the toe puff, and the whole shoe becomes useless. You know, so she's got, you know, she goes to slide with this and she falls over because the left one isn't stable. Or she grips with the left and she can't slide with the right because it's too sticky. Um, and so each of those 13 elements in our toolbox has a huge variety of options. You know, style-wise, there must be a hundred basic styles um, that can be chosen from. And, and um, uh, w you know, when you see the students in university where I teach and they, they think they've done something new and, it, it, you know, it, you've seen it 10, 20 times before in the last 10 years, 12 years you've been teaching. Um, but all they've done is put a slightly different decoration on it. So, but there's, you know, given that variety, it has to be right, you know, and all the way through down to the heel top piece has to be absolutely right or the whole thing is wrong. So that is the skill that we have and that's why um, it's really important to build up this knowledge and uh, actually get everything right uh, for whatever one of the condition categories we're dealing with.